Our scripture reading this morning for our message in Colossians is very familiar because it's one I cannot help but continually remind you of. And it comes straight from Colossians chapter 1, Paul's prayer. That is the catalyst for everything that he says in the rest of the letter. Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 12 the Apostle says this, For this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So that for this purpose, Paul says, you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience, joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. That is Paul's prayer for the Colossian church and for all believers, it is my prayer for you. And I hope and pray as we continue to slowly move through this letter that you always come back to these four verses. Memorize them. Let them be constantly on your heart because they are a constant reminder of the simplicity and the purity of the Christian life. A couple of weeks ago, or two weeks ago rather, we started chapter 2 and we looked at verses 1 through 3 and that message was specifically a message of encouragement, I hope, and comfort to you as we focused last week on the Lord's Supper. Uh, we didn't go into Colossians, so this week our focus of verses is verses 2 through 5, so a little bit, the first part of this message is going to be a little bit of repeat, and I hope that's okay, um, because we need to be um, reminded of what Paul gave us. Again, in verse 2, the word of focus there was encouraged. Paul wanted us, wants the church to be encouraged, and we, and we looked at that from the angle of that word encouraged from comfort, and our comfort comes from Christ alone. It's in Christ alone. If you ever need comfort, go to Christ. No matter what it is, no matter what the situation, he has experienced it, gone through it, bore the same burden. He knows he is our comfort in all things. But this, but, but the thrust of Paul's message here with this word encouraged is more urgent. It's more intense. He, he is so concerned for them that they understand what they are what they are facing and how to face it. And again, the message is the same. I love the fact that I get to preach the same thing over and over and over again with different words. It's Christ alone. That's it. What's the answer to life? Christ alone. What's the answer to your joy? Christ alone. What's the answer to your problem? Christ alone. And everything is. In between. So as Paul is writing to them, he's writing to, to them in a general sense. And I'll just read verses 1 through 5 of, of, of chapter 2 to set our context for us. And then we'll flow through them. But Paul says, for I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea. And for all those who have not personally seen my face that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery that is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And here's the thrust of our message this morning, a message of warning and a message of Result. Verse 4, I say this 
so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Before we dive into the verses, I just want to remind us something that I have said before at least once in, um, in our study of Colossians. We have to remember the Colossian church was a very small, insignificant city located in the middle of Asia Minor, what today is modern day Turkey. And they weren't well known. They weren't a well known people, but they received this, this Christian handbook, so to speak. Um, from the Apostle Paul, a letter that we have to consider probably was the only scripture they ever saw of the New Testament. The church at Colossae, they, ne they never read Paul's letter to the Romans. Most likely, they had zero contact with any of the Gospels. The book of Revelation hadn't even been written yet. So the only contact they possibly had with another letter, because Paul tells them in the at the end of this letter uh, to read this letter and pass it on to Laodicea and to read the, the letter that was coming from Laodicea. Most scholars um, land on the fact that that letter from Laodicea was probably at the, uh, the letter to the Ephesians. And so, which was, which is very similar to this letter in, uh, to the Colossian church. But as we think about that, let's think about the, what that means a little bit. To not have the whole word of God. A, a letter from an apostle. And, and, and hopefully, to some degree, um, if there was a local synagogue, possibly access to the Old Testament. But no access to the new. We, we, we can't fathom that because we've grown up our entire lives with all of God's revelation. How can you be a Christian without the Bible? How can you be a Christian without understanding the totality of the message of Christ? We, we don't think about those things because we take them for granted. But... But it is absolutely amazing to me to think about these concepts because the power is not in man. The power is in God. The power of God, his word, the power of the gospel that comes into a heart. That is the work. That's the glory. That's what God does. And so and, and I'm constantly in amazement by that because I, I think the most extreme example we have in the scriptures is in Genesis chapter 5 with the life of Enoch. Walked with God 300 years. God was so pleased with him, he did not die. God took him up. One of only two people in history, along with the prophet Elijah. And I ask myself this question almost daily, because I think about this almost daily. How can you walk with God for 300 years? No Bible. No church, no hymns. How do you do that? Our God is amazing. The power of God to reveal himself to a heart is amazing. So we can never forget that as we approach a letter like Colossians, not, not common, written specifically to them, and, and, and encompassing at least two other churches, and in verse 1 of chapter 2, Paul mentions the church at Laodicea that they were to swap letters with. And for all those who have not personally seen my face, he says. But at the end, he mentions the city of Hierapolis as well. They were kind of in this, this, this tri-city um, <clears throat> aspect going on there between those, uh, those three cities of Colossae, Hierapolis, and Laodicea. So Paul says... He, is, he is, has a great struggle because they're all experiencing the same things. All of these churches, all of God's people, as we can lump that into everyone who has not personally seen my face. And fast forward this all the way to our day and time. 
We're facing the same thing. And this same thing is very specific that we will touch lightly on this morning because Paul just kind of lands and then takes off again into this glorious truth of Christ. He cannot help himself to proclaim the glories and the wonders of Christ. So, but what is the point? What is the focus? Paul says he's struggling on their behalf, and but he wants them to be encouraged. And, and we have to... We have to think greatly about this. The fact that not only does he want us to be encouraged, but the fact that we can be encouraged by the truth that he is giving. And this truth, he says, to be encouraged since we've been knit together in love. Paul has the same struggle for all the churches, and he has the same purpose. If you have an outline, if you grab one this morning, I know I just jumped really quick because we touched on these two uh, two weeks ago. But the fact is, he, we have been knit together in love. And when, and when I preached this two weeks ago, we went back to this fact, the fact that God, in chapter earlier in chapter 1, has qualified us. God is the one who has transferred us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. An amazing, glorious grace that we have received and because of that great love, that's the love with which we've been knit together. It's not from our affection or our love for one another. I know I'm not that great. And I know your love for me, and I hope and pray, is contingent upon your love for Christ. But that is our love focus. That we've been knit together in Christ, in God. And not only have we been knit together... But this knitting together, this receiving of Christ, the full revelation of Christ that we've been looking at for weeks and weeks and months and months, that this aspect of the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding. Those who know Christ walk in full assurance of understanding. Those who know Christ and are continually longing and striving to know Christ to learn all they can about him, are, are receiving nothing but riches, pure riches, pure wealth. By that great love and that great wealth of fullness of understanding, we come to the true knowledge of God's mystery that Paul says is Christ, is Christ alone. A glorious truth. For us to walk in, to be comforted by, and to be encouraged in, because in the urgency and the intensity of this encouragement that we need to be encouraged by is because we are engaged in a constant fight, a constant struggle, a constant battle with the things of this world. But we need not worry because in Christ, as verse 3 says, in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And, and, and I want to take a second to go back here. Um, just, just look at the words. The wealth, the full assurance, the understanding, the knowledge. God, His mystery, Christ, the wisdom. It's all singular. It's all of those words are in the singular. There's only one. And it is all in God. One wealth. One assurance, one understanding, one knowledge, one Christ, one wisdom. That is so important for our comfort, and it is so important for us to press on. And this, this fight of faith in this world and this life that Paul is about to address, and he does it with a warning. And the warning is the same for all, for the Colossians, the Laodiceans, and for Emmanuel Baptist Church in Salem, Arkansas, and every other church. Paul says, I say this so that everything that he has said, not just in the preceding three verses, but that he has said already in the entire letter, it goes back to everything. I say, Paul says, all of this, all of the doctrine of Christ, Back in chapter 1, starting in verse 15, he is the creator, the sustainer, the redeemer, the head of the church. 
the mystery of God. All of this, Paul says, I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive arguments. This is Paul's point of the letter. So that no one, not one single person, not even yourself, as James chapter 1 verse 22 says, James says, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. We can deceive ourselves as, long, as well as the rest of the world being deceivers. But Paul says, I say that so that no one will delude you, deceive you, to defraud you with persuasive argument. We live in a world of nothing but lies and deception. Everything in our world, everything within the kingdom of darkness is designed to delude us from the truth of Christ. And it's everywhere and it's all over the place. And one of the things, again, to, to, to step back in time to Colossians or to the, to the church of Colossae, we can look back and go, they didn't have all the distractions we have today. They weren't constantly bombarded everywhere we look, everything that we hear. The message of this world system constantly barraging us and fighting against us, striking out against us to rob us of the treasure of Christ. It's constant. It never ceases. It never stops. And Paul says, I'm saying all of this. I want you to be reminded. I, not just reminded. Paul wants us to be fixated, focused, obsessed with Christ. Everything about Christ. All of his fullness in every way. So that we will not be deluded. Deceived by the persuasive argument. This word persuasive argument. It's actually one word in the Greek. One that Paul possibly just made up. It's the only time it's used, but it literally means to speak artfully. For almost 7,000 years, Satan has had the time to hone his craft. Okay? He knows what he's doing. Not to give him too much credit, but he's had a lot of time to work out how to delude and deceive Mankind, especially God's people. But the, but the literal sense is this persuasive argument is an art form. And it sounds good to the ear so often. Because it pleases man. It is man-centered. And even though that we have received Christ, we still fight with the old man. And the old man is man-centered as well. And the world's message so often, it, it's deluding. And in that delusion is persuasion. Paul says, I'm writing all of these things. I want you to be fixated on all these things so that no one will delude you with a persuasive argument. It's intentional, this argument. It's purposeful. It's clever. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20, Paul tells Timothy, O oh, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you, avoiding worldly and empty chatter, and opposing the arguments of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and thus gone astray from the faith his final word of that verse is grace be with you. That's very telling because we need that constant grace. But he says, he, he tells him to guard what he's been entrusted with. To avoid opposing the arguments. Those are direct battle terms. We are to be purposeful, not just, not just dwelling on Christ. But acting in Christ. Just a few more verses here regarding the persuasiveness of this argument. 
Isaiah 57 verse 20 says, but the wicked are like the tossing sea for it cannot be quiet and its waters toss up refuse and mud. Living most of my life in Florida, spent some time at the beach, not a lot because it's not my favorite place to go. But I can tell you this, at the beach, if you've never been there, the waves are constant. And it's not just not the action and the movement, it's the sound. It's constant. It never ceases. The waves just roll over and over. And Isaiah's point is, this is the wicked. This is their message. For they cannot be quiet. But all that they churn up, all that they toss up is refuse and mud. Worthless things. The foam of the sea is worthless. The persuasive arguments of the world are worthless. But because it's constant, because it's consistent as the waves of the sea, we always have to face it, which means we always have to be alert. We always have to be watchful. And the, and the best and the only way to do that is to always be centered and focused on Christ alone. But let's be honest, we're not doing that, are we? Christ alone means Christ alone in every way, in every sense. This persuasive argument comes to us in so many ways to delude us. And, 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 and the easy, the simplest thing is, is we have the power to shut most of it off. One little four-letter word, stop. I'll add another one, it. Stop it. <laughs> I would encourage you, as long as we are in this letter of Colossians, to constantly be reading it. If you sat down, it, it would take you probably about 10 to 15 minutes to read this letter. Okay? And, and just the simple sentence because we of sit down and read a whole letter of the Bible. Usually like the longest book of the Bible comes to our mind and we go, oh my goodness, I couldn't do that in one sitting. Okay, but we can. 15 minutes. All right. Check your phones. Probably some of you probably spent more than 15 minutes on Facebook already today. Okay, if you can do that, you can read this letter. And I would read it daily and I would read it constantly. What if? What if this was the only portion of scripture you possessed? How precious would it be to you? What if we took all of it away except this? How important would this letter be to you? To receive and understand the glorious truths of Christ. To fight against this world. And I would dare say, I'm not telling, I'm not saying disregard the rest of scripture. But I am saying if this letter is all you had, it is enough to turn it off. It is enough to fight the persuasive arguments of this world. In Romans 16 verse 18. Of these persuasive arguers. Paul says for such men are slaves. Not of our Lord Christ. But of their own appetites. And by their smoothness and their flattering speech. They deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. That word unsuspecting should never be used. Of a child of God. We, we are told. What to look out for. We're told why to look out for it. We're told that it is constant. And it's never going to stop coming at us. We have no reason. To ever be unsuspecting. And if we are. It's our fault. We have to stay alert. And we have to be aware. And we can only do this by being fixated on Christ. Again, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, Paul says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. For it is written, He is the one, God is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the reasonings of the wise, and they are useless. They're useless. Are we going to listen to God or are we going to listen as man, to man? There's only two options. It's God or it's man. This is an exclusive nothing. Folks, there's nothing like Christianity. 
nothing. All of the sound doctrine within Christianity, there is nothing like it on the earth. There's many counterfeits. There, there, there are many uh, false teachings regarding it. But the true teaching of the scriptures, there's nothing like it on the, in the world. The doctrine of the Trinity, nothing, no worldly religion touches that. No human mind could think of it. There's no way. God is the one who has revealed that to us. God himself coming down and putting on flesh to pay the price for our sins. Nobody comes up with that. Every other religion is about us doing something to get to God. The, the, the glory of Christianity is that we had to do nothing. God came to us. There's nothing like it. And those are just two examples Big, heavy examples, mind you, but all of Scripture. There's nothing like it. It and it alone keeps us from being deluded by the persuasive argument. But really quickly, verse five here, <clears throat> Paul gives us the warning in verse four. But all of this, he, 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 he simplifies it down to two aspects of or two results that are supposed to take place. All of this truth he's given us, all of this encouragement he's given us leads to ultimately two simple things. Paul says, for even though I am absent in body, nevertheless, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. This good discipline simply means order, an arrangement, a fixed succession of things. Does good discipline describe your life in Christ? Does stability describe your life in Christ? The truth of Christ leads to these ultimate results. In 1 Corinthians 14, 40, Paul says, but all things... And in this verse, he is speaking of the church specifically, uh, the order of, of service, order within the body, the gathering together. But it applies to all of the Christian life. All things are to be done properly and in an orderly manner. Good discipline in what? Good discipline in living the Christian life. Good discipline in our study of Christ. Folks, we need, above anything else in the scripture, we need to have a high Christology, which is the study of Christ. We need to be people who are constantly studying who Christ is, what he's done. First and foremost, to be able to continue to progress in our worship of him, but to provide second, secondarily to good discipline and stability. We are to have order and we are to have a solid foundation, a solid support that we stand on, a strength, a firmness to our faith. And what is our faith in? Christ alone, as verse 5 ends. The faith is in Christ. It's not in religion. It's not in service. It's not in ceremony. It's not in ritual. It is in a person. Christ alone. 2 Peter 3.17 says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you are not carried away by the error of unprincipled men, and fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's our purpose. That's, that's our pleasure and our joy above all, all things. Because Paul says... I rejoice to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith. Folks, 
As your pastor, I rejoice to see you grow in Christ. To grow in the grace and the knowledge. That's why we're taking so much time to be meticulous here. And, and even then, it's not, it's not exhaustive enough. But that's why we take so much time with the Word of God. Because I don't want you to be shaken. I don't want you to be unstable in regards to your faith. I want you to be sure and solid as Paul declares here. I'm going to close. If you would turn over probably just a few pages to Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to close with verses 14 through 24 to sum this up. And while you're turning there, Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 14, I want to encourage you. I, I, I would encourage each one of you. I hope that you would come back tonight at 5 o'clock because this is probably about 20% of the whole study that I've done on this section. And, and for those of you who come on Sunday night already, you know that the Sunday morning is just that service. The Sunday night service is an expansion of this message. Uh, one of the things that I can't stand is the fact that we just give one-off messages when we need to be chewing and meditating on the Word of God. And so that's what we do Sunday night. We go back over this. We're going to look at so many other scriptures tonight and talk about so many other things. God wants his people to know him repeatedly throughout the scriptures. And we'll look at so many of them tonight. It, it is the cry of God's heart that my people do not know me. God doesn't change. That's still the cry of God's heart, I think, in the church today. That his people do not know him. So that's why we take the time on Sunday night to, to expand this even deeper. So I would encourage you to come back at 5 o'clock for that. But in closing this morning, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 through 24. As a result, Paul says, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. By the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head and that head is Christ. From whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. A part that we have in that, folks. Verse 17, So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their hearts. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. Folks, verse 20. You did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. The truth is everything. Our world today does not believe in truth. God is truth. We must know him. We must love him. We must seek him. We must enjoy 
all that is in him for the sake of our good discipline and the stability of our faith in Christ. Let's pray. Father, I pray that your people would be encouraged by the blessing that we can know you. Not by our own intellect, our own reason, our own opinions, or our own ideas, but we can know you because you have revealed yourself to us. You have revealed you are revealing day by day through the truth of your holy scripture. Lord, I pray that we would be people of your word. That we would be people who not only read and study, but take your word on our knees in prayer. Seeking to know you more. You are our only hope. Only you provide the comfort, the stability, the discipline to overcome. May we be people who truly overcome by the power of your truth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.